What a week, huh? This is the time of celebration, a time of list building, and then a time of task management. Take what you've learned this week, the fire hose, all of the information, break it down into what you need to do first, and then do it. It only matters if you act. Thinking about it is okay. But if you want to make money in this business, you have to do something. You have all the tools you need to do. And now we're going to talk to this high-powered panel about what they're doing, what they've done, and their celebration. Introduce yourself and say how many books you have published. Kyla. My name is uh, Kyla Stone. I write in the post-apocalyptic uh, genre, survival thrillers, uh, lots of killing people. Um, I've been, I published my first indie book in December of 2016, and I have 27 books out. My name is Adam Fuller. I write under D.D. Black. I used to write under A.C. Fuller. I have about 33-ish books out, depending on what you count. Um, they are mysteries and thrillers. I'm Mark Recklow. I write self-help, non-fiction, advice on how to. I have 13 books. My critics say I have one book written it 13 times. <laughs> but I'm in Vegas and they are not. I'm Laurie Matthews. I write romantic suspense and I have 14 books out. I'm Bert Andrews. I write reverse harem romance and I have nine books. Sometimes it's not about quantity, it's about quality. Even though sometimes quantity has a quality all its own. What sees the light of day? is the best books. And that's what we have up here. Whether 27 books or nine, these people all make an incredible living off their books. But the biggest question I have to ask is, are you happy? So starting with uh, Kyla, how do you define happiness in this business for you? Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Happiness is um, being able to do what I have dreamed to do since I was five years old. Um, happiness is being able to provide for my family. Um, when Back when I was early on, just a few years in, we were driving a 20-year-old van that we couldn't afford to fix, and it broke down one day, and I had the money, and I could fix it. And, and that meant a lot to me. It's also about freedom, like no bosses telling you what to do, um, <clears throat> no rules to follow but the ones you make for yourself. Um, happiness is also um, making a difference and giving back and getting those emails from readers that say, like, you changed my life or I was going through a really, really hard time. I got an email um, from someone who his 16-year-old son had died that week, and he said the only thing that gave me a break from that pain was reading your book, so thank you. And to me, it's one of the most meaningful, meaningful things that we can do as writers is making that connection with other people and making their day a little better and giving them a bit of that joy and happiness. Uh, one of my goals early on was to be able to retire my wife from her job, assuming she still wanted to, and she retired last week, I think. <laughs> so spending more time with her, but also being able to be around for my kids all the, whenever they're around, so that I, I kind of bend my schedule to their schedule. That's something that's been really important to me, so I can wake up with my son when he's getting ready for school and be done with work by the time he gets home from school, spend more time with him. Those were kind of my first two goals. Um, entertaining people is a lot of fun. 
I, I don't think that's a bad thing just to entertain people. And like Kyla said, getting emails from people who are undergoing chemotherapy and they're sitting with their Kindle in the hospital reading your books and they're plowing through seven books in a week while they're in the worst suffering of their life and they email you about it. Um, it's, I think entertainment is phenomenal. Education is phenomenal too. Um, so entertaining people, spending time with my family, mm -hmm. that's the number one things for me. Yep. What is happiness? Yeah, I wrote a whole book about it and now I don't remember anything. <laughs> but I mean, the most important thing is that happiness comes from the inside. Happiness comes first. So many times we think if we reach certain goals, we will become happy and then we reach <laughs> them and we don't take a break and we just go move on to the next goal. So happiness is also enjoying the moment, literally smelling the roses, right? And for me, happiness is doing what I want with who I want, where I want, taking care of my family, and also this, yeah, when, you know, when you get emails from readers, so the one amazing one was a roommate. It was the roommate writing to me, said, my roommate wanted to commit suicide, and he re read your book, and then he didn't. And that's amazing. And two months later, the guy wrote to me, and I was like, I know the story, are you Conrad? And it's just amazing, you know, and that's the power we have to change life, to entertain, to make people happy. Happiness for me is getting to do what I love to do, getting those voices in my head, out of my head and on paper, because sometimes they're loud and annoying. Happiness is also sitting around my kitchen table going, I have to kill somebody. What do you think? And asking my kids. <laughs> it's great. I think my son is somewhat scared. My daughter is totally on board, and we have great <laughs> conversations. But happiness is also traveling with my family and doing all the things together, and at the same time bringing my laptop and sitting somewhere on the floor in a corner and still writing. And that speaks to my heart when I get to do that, when I get to enjoy everything with my family and still enjoy what I get to do. And happiness is also when people reach out and say, oh my God, I read your book and it was just so fabulous and it, it made me so happy and I, I can't thank you enough. And when I get to do things like dedicate my book to super fans who take my swag all over the world with them when they travel and take pictures and I get to say back to them, you have made me happy. You've brought me the most amount of joy. It's just incredible. So for me, um, I, I'd always wanted to write. I have ADHD and I went 34 years undiagnosed. And so I always thought and was always told, you won't be able to do this. And you know, now I have two children who are autistic and probably also have a touch of the ADHD. Um, you know, I, want, I wanted to go into this as it doesn't matter if your brain works differently than other people, you can still have your dreams and be successful and don't let anybody tell you you can't do something. So really, I'm happiest when I'm empowering other people, neurodivergent people, um, especially you know in romance, uh, women who are having like self-confidence issues and bringing awareness to mental health. Uh, that it just makes me so happy when readers get something, you know, from my words. ADHD is a superpower. Never let anybody tell you anything different. Sticking with that thought, what is one thing you do to bring news more readers to your newsletter? Which is actually a completely different thought. <laughs> we'll start with Britt. What, what now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> How to say you've got ADHD without... I got distracted. Yeah. <laughs> What's one thing you do to bring news, uh, new subscribers into your newsletter? Um, so I actually did a round of character interviews when I released the fifth book in my series. 
and it went so great. So what I would do is post in my Facebook reader group, you know, this week we're gonna be interviewing this character. What are the questions you have for him? Him is me. And, <laughs> you know, they would submit all of these questions as like they're talking directly to the character. And then I would copy them into my newsletter and reply in character to them. And within seconds, you know, the group is blowing up with, I cannot believe that he just said that. <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe it either. It's crazy. <laughs> um, but I saw a huge um, uptick in new subscribers because when they're coming into your reader group with something exclusive that they can't get anywhere else, everybody else wants it. So, the, you know, it was just, it was a really great idea and I encourage anybody to give that a try. So one of the things I do, of course, is bonus scenes. But beyond that, I have what I call a book in the drawer all the time. I have a spare book, a book that I haven't published. And I give it out to my newsletter crew. And I tell everybody out there about it, join my newsletter to get this free book that isn't published. And when they go to download it, they get a message that says, hey, tell me what you think about this book. I haven't put it out there yet. I want your feedback. Help me make it stronger. Help me make it better. Should I keep going with the series? What are your thoughts? And it gets everybody to join my newsletter. And then I get all these emails and all these DMs about it. And we have these great conversations. And then I write the book, do the tweaks, put it out, and they're thrilled. And they all buy it because they're thrilled that they had a piece of making it better. I'm old school, I'm still doing the same thing that I did eight years ago. I put something in, in the front matter, in the back matter, download these free coaching worksheets, and please sign up for my email list. It still works, but I guess I have to up my game a little bit, my newsletter game. <laughs> Maybe you don't, because mine is far worse than yours. <laughs> when I started my new pen name about a year ago, I decided not to make newsletter a focus and not to do a free novella and just kind of leave that whole strategy uh, behind. I did that before. For me, it just took a lot of time and I wanted to focus on the writing. So you can do incredibly well. I think I've gotten 37 organic subscribers in 16 months. Um, <clears throat> I did one like book funnel thing. I think I got a few hundred subscribers for my new pen name. Um, so that list sits at about 337 people. You can make gobs of money without an email list. It's possible, I don't recommend it. I should do better on an email list, but I haven't bothered to do that yet. Which is why there's so many ways up the mountain. I'm also, I have a newsletter, but I'm not doing what Britt's doing. It's like, that's a great idea. Oh, one thing, yeah. I, one thing I did um, was I wrote an epilogue um, af after the end of a series. Everybody's always emailing me, well, what happened later? Like, what happened a year from now or two years from now? Um, so I did a six chapter epilogue and it's only available to newsletter subscribers. So talk about it in my readers group, put a link in the back of the last book in the series. Hey, if you want to see, there's more, there's more. You can find out what happened to them a year later, but sign up for my email. All right. Thank you. Thank you. What did you like most about 20 books Vegas? Britt. This is my, by far my favorite week of the year. This is my third year coming. Um, the first year I came here, I attended this panel you know, in the audience and I said to my friend next to me, I said, I'm gonna be up there one day. That's my goal, I'm gonna do it and I'm here. So the best thing about coming here is meeting all of you. It fills my well every single time. And even though I go home exhausted and don't want to talk to anybody for a week, it makes me feel so good to come and share what I know with people. And also remember that I started where you are. And if I'm up here, you can be up here. And I love to just put that message out to all of you. If I'm here, you can be here. This is not rocket science. Yeah, the community. It's definitely the best community that I ever have seen. Keep on rocking. I agree with what they said. I'd also add, so I joined the 20 
books group in 2016 when it was maybe 800 or so people. Uh, now it's like a 75-ish thousand. What I couldn't believe was everyone was just giving away all these secrets for free with screenshots on my Facebook feed. And I was just starting as an indie author and I was thinking, how do you do all this? And people were posting all the secrets of how to do it for free, just the spirit of giving and the fact that that has now become a 2,000 person conference where that, I think, really manifests through everyone here is shocking and amazing and fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, just to echo what everybody else said, I think this is the most generous, <laughs> kind, and loving community I have ever been a part of. And this is my tribe, and I love being here. What's the first thing you're going to do next week after you decompress from this? Kyla. Yeah, after sleeping for a while. No, not everybody gets in at 3 in the morning. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I am really excited about translations. I have started um, some German translations. I'm going to expand into French and Italian. I went to... Um, the translations, um, one of the sessions, very exciting what's happening in other countries. And I'm a firm believer that you should get as much out of each IP as you have. Like every book can do so much work. Like you've already written the book. Like why not sell it in other countries and find new readers? Um, so that's something I'm really excited about. Maybe I should start a newsletter is the first thing I do. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to, though. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying newsletters are bad. I think they're great. I just, I'm always choosing where to spend my energy, and I haven't chosen to do it there yet. What I will spend it on are um, German translations, a huge push into Amazon ads with a lot of spend behind that. Um, I have a new assistant coming on full-time in January, getting her going on TikTok and Instagram, and then taking some of my old AC Fuller books and revising them and republishing them under my new pen name to kind of do what Kyla says, taking stuff that's no longer making much money for you and making it better and repurposing it for a new audience. So that was four things, but I'll do, I'll start on those all on day one. <laughs> I won't finish them on day one. I'll finish my 14th book and, and I will do some more Facebook ads and Shopify. I'm really excited about Shopify. So I always leave one of these events with three items, always. And my goal is to accomplish those three items by six months out. So next week I start, one, my Shopify store. I'm working on it. It's going to be up hopefully by January. Two, there's a super secret project that I'm working on with a lot of the other authors. And we're super excited about it. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And three, this year I have a couple of Again, I always have extra books in the drawer, and um, I'm going to try some Kindle Vela with them. So it should be fun. I did a Kickstarter uh, at the end of August, and the book isn't even out yet, but it got $100,000 pledged to it, so I should probably write it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys uh, have earned your right to be up on the stage for the final panel. What advice would you be, give to somebody starting out to get here? Besides, have that attitude that you can make it. Of course, you've got to believe. First and foremost, you have to believe in yourself, and I think that's one thing that this conference does better than anything else, is it helps everybody believe that you can do it. Because we're all here for the same reason, sell one more book sell one more book. Kyla. Craig, you kind of took what I was going to say. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> um, I would say be stubborn and don't give up. Um, my first year, I made $5,000 the entire year, and it wasn't really making $5,000 because I had spent money on editing and covers and all of that. Um, second year was 25 thousand and then um, it wasn't until the third year where I hit my six uh, my first six figure um, year and that was about nine books in if I had quit after the first book the second the third the fourth and I would not be up here so be as stubborn as you need to be because you never know the next book can blow everything up and change your life yeah I, I decided early on that 
I would have to take kind of any amount of rejection going down this career path and just decided I would take any amount of rejection that came along. I was trying the traditional route. Anyone who's tried that knows a lot of rejection letters come with that. It's just part of it. But also that can be really difficult emotionally, right? We can say we're going to be relentless and take any amount of rejection, but it actually gets really difficult sometimes. So I would say, for me, one of the biggest things that changed the trajectory of my career was taking my mental health more seriously and deciding to focus on kind of what was stopping me in my relationships, in my career, and getting more on more sound footing, uh, which has increased my productivity a lot. It's increased my willingness to do hard things, like learn Facebook ads, stuff I don't want to do. Maybe if I get enough therapists, I'll start a newsletter. <laughs> um, I, I just don't enjoy that part of it. But anyway, take care of your mental health. That means different things for everyone here, whether that is you know a therapist, a spiritual advisor, friends, whatever it is. Um, without that, you're not going to write as much. You're not going to write as well. You're not going to market as well. And everything will fall apart. And so just focus on that and all the relentless stuff, too. Yeah, I wish I could come up with something new, but it's really believe in yourself. Never, ever, ever, ever give up. It's like Kayla said, you never know when it comes. So I was a struggling author for four, five years. When I started doing Amazon ads, I didn't see huge changes for 17 months. So when I, do, when I talk about this in front of a crowd, I always, I always ask who of you would have done 17 months the same thing without seeing huge results. But then on the 18th month, everything exploded. I like to be a little bit, um, it's like a bottle of ketchup, you know, when you, you hit and hit, <laughs> nothing happens and then everything comes out. So that's... <laughs> That's what she said. It's always so much fun to be here. <laughs> I guess the thing I would say, very similar, there is something to mindset, but I will throw out another title for all of you instead of writer and author. You're all entrepreneurs, and you need to embrace that. I found when I made that mental switch to think of myself as an entrepreneur, everything clicked into place. Take your emotions and pour them out on the page, but look at your business with clear eyes. Make sure you make your decisions based on fact and based on logic. Don't base them on emotion. You're selling a product, and the products happen to be the books that you write, but realistically, you could be selling socks. Think of it that way, because sometimes it's the emotion that gets in the way of you succeeding. <laughs> I don't want anyone to change my beloved baby that I just wrote. I disagree with my editor. Well, then don't hire that editor. If you don't believe in the people that you've hired, then you need to find people you do believe in. But if it's just because you don't want to change the thing and you want to argue with them, Take a step back and realize that your emotion is getting in the way of your success. So just remember, emotion goes on the page, not in your business. When I started uh, my writing journey, I was flat broke in the process of losing my house. Um, just at the bottom of the barrel you know I know a lot of you can relate to that and I didn't expect this to happen on any level it's very humbling and I just want everybody that's here to know that you need to figure out who you are like who am I at my core am I writing about stuff that means something to me because if it means something to me, it's gonna mean something to my readers. And that's like the most important thing is, you know, for longevity and, and connection with your fan base, you have to know who you are at your core and surround yourself with people who make you the best version of you. People that inspire you to continue to create your art because that's what we are, artists and creators. And if you're not, feeling inspired by people you're around, then you're probably not around the right people. 
and it's hard to hear that sometimes, but I'm here to tell you that that's okay, and you can you need to protect yourself. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. What do you do to relax, Britt? <laughs> I do lots of stuff. Um, binge watch TV. I love television shows that I can just sit and completely, you know, escape reality. I, we live in a lake community, so I, you know, when it's nice out, take my kids down to the lake and we go swimming or, you know, go on the jet skis. Um, I really like hand embroidery. I don't know. It's, I feel like a colonial woman when I'm doing it, but <laughs> it's like, um, all my focus is on what's in my hand, so it's it's actually like really good for anxiety and just you know zoning out, so stuff like that. Drink. <laughs> I um, two years ago made my family move into the woods with me, uh, into this house that's totally surrounded by trees, and so it brings me such joy, just to be outside, surrounded by trees and nature. I am not a nature person, to be clear. But I like being out in my backyard. Um, I also love to hang out with my friends and my family. I find that it's really good for me. They make me laugh, and that helps me relax. And of course, reading, lounging in front of the TV, and just generally being a couch potato. I take long walks, binge a little bit on Netflix, and I like to watch comedy because it's the greatest feeling when the tears go down <laughs> of laughing, right? So that relaxes me immensely. I'm one of those people who, when I get stressed about a book, I just start a whole new series. Um, <laughs> I, I think actually that is the most relaxed, I, mean, I don't get very relaxed usually. The most relaxed I am is when I'm procrastinating one book and I come up with this amazing new idea and start outlining it. And I'm in that phase where there's no pressure, there's no deadline, it's all fun. There's incredible, maybe some world building, cool characters, but I don't have the pressure to actually turn it into words someone would pay for. So I think that's when I'm at my most relaxed. Sometimes I do that with my wife walking on the beach where there's brainstorming ideas. That's relaxing. And we have our corgi with us. Um, other than that, I don't relax much. Uh, scuba diving with sharks. Um, yeah, actually, um, travel and doing exciting new things, um, something I really enjoy. Um, I also like to spend time with friends and family, and I try to read every single day. That's excellent. That's excellent. Thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe, Adam, you can send a note out to your newsletter list and ask them what you should do to <laughs> relax. If, if I get a 30% open rate, that will be nine people. <laughs> Maybe one response. <laughs> what do you do to connect? I already asked that one. What do you do to, for your main character in your best-selling series to keep them relatable? How do you write them? And nonfiction, how do you relate to the reader when they're reading that? Britt. In nonfiction? No, no, no. Oh, you, you got it. Yep. Trick question. So, my favorite character, um, she's a plus size green witch, which is very underrepresented underrepresented in romance, and <laughs> she, um, you know, goes through a lot of like self acceptance, uh, you know, body acceptance stuff throughout her journey across these five books, but something in particular that I did with her character that wasn't planned, you know, I'm at the end of this series and something just wasn't working and it's like, it's romance, it's a happily ever after, you know what you need to write, like just get on with it. But I couldn't do it and it was because um, she had just given birth and finally it dawned on me like, you know, she has postpartum and that's what I wrote. And there was a lot of people who questioned me on that. Or is, are you sure that's something that you want to do? Because that 
like, you know, genre expectations is happily ever after. And I said, well, you can have both. You can have a happily ever after and postpartum depression because I've done it three times. And the number of women who contact me and say either that they didn't know they had a problem with postpartum until they read that in my story and then they were able to get help is so moving that it just, I just have no words for it and it just gives me goosebumps every time it happens and it happens all the time. So, you know, yes, they read to escape reality, but having something in there that's really, really relatable is, I think it's just priceless. So for me, um, like Brit, I write strong female characters, characters that will always go toe to toe with the hero. Um, I think it's super important to put that out there. And I know my readers love it. They contact me and talk to me about how they love seeing a strong heroine who is not afraid of standing up for herself. So it's always in the backbone of every single book. The thing I really think is important about it is it means that I'm putting someone out there who's an equal. And it's always important for me, for my characters to be seen as equals. It's just a fundamental. And I think it really makes the connection with my readers because they see it and they appreciate it and they comment on it. And then I know that they're getting my message. So for me, it's pretty easy because I'm just writing about what I'm experiencing. And that makes the connection, I think, biggest strength authenticity, Ooh, what a word, but I could say it, authenticity, and then they know I answer every email, I'm very proud of that. I even, the bad ones, although the bad ones now I don't answer anymore, but they know they can contact me all the time, and I think that creates the connection. For my new series, I set out to make my character a little more relatable, my main series character, and I want to do that two ways one more superficial and one deeper. So the superficial ways are, my readers tend to be a little older. I am already getting confused by technology with each passing day, so my character is too. He's just a little behind the times in technology. My readers relate to that, right? Every new iPhone update, they're confused about what the hell's going on. Um, so am I. The deeper level is, is emotional. Most people have experienced some deep grief in their life, the loss of a loved one, some tragedy. They know that feeling. It's deeper than most of the stuff we go around talking about all day. So I gave my character a fairly deep well of grief that he is functioning through at a pretty high level. It's not really about that, but his wife was murdered. Uh, that's his backstory. Not that uncommon in detective sort of stories. Um, but I think people can relate to that, because when you know the character is in pain that they didn't cause themselves, uh, you want them to get out of it, and that's relatable, because we've mostly been there. Um, kind of seconding um, what Adam said, um, I write post-apocalyptic thrillers, but um, one of my uh, most popular characters, Hannah, starts um, page one, she's been held captive by a a psychopath and she escapes um, the day of the world ending event as the world's collapsing around her but she's endured um, years of horrific abuse and she has to find the strength within herself to make it home to her five-year-old son that is her goal um, and I think a lot of readers really connected with her um, thank God we are not all having to experience that um, but we all go through hard things and um, to be able to read a character journey um, as she finds that inner strength within herself, um, I think really readers really connected with that. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you see the august members of this panel. We've got eight minutes. Let's take your questions, probably three or four. Uh, please, that we got the microphone right here out of the direct view of the camera. If you'd like to ask a question, come on up and ask away. And if you don't, then we can talk about the Canary Islands. <laughs> Virgin Islands are off limits. This is the clean panel. I can't hear them I'm in the wrong place. That puts us in the wrong place, How'd I get Greg. Here? We're just gonna go if that's the This case. is it. We're just gonna leave now. Everybody just walk off and uh, <laughs> we're there. 
What was the first big purchase you made when you realized your success? We know what Kyla's was. No, just, uh, yeah, um, bought a car to fix the 20 year old van that had broken down. Felt really good. I would say once I hit sort of significant success, the biggest, not a purchase, but sort of buying my wife out of her job, um, you know, that was the most important purchase for me and I think for her and for the rest of our family. Um, and that's a pretty big purchase. She had a pretty good job. I set up three companies in Malta to save taxes. <laughs> we started traveling more with the whole family. I bought a car. I, I did the same thing, I bought a truck. I paid cash for it, that was so cool. Question. That feels good. Before you were up here, when, before you had been able to quit your day job, when you were at your lowest with writing, when you were at the, the hardest part, what did you do, what did you think, what did you say to yourself to get past that part? Pick, pick, two, uh, pick two panelists to answer your question. Um, Britt and Kyla. So, this is gonna be really uh, shocking, but I'm at that moment currently, and I'm not sure how I'm gonna get out of it, but I'm hoping that you know, being here uh, you know, refills me and motivates me and you know that's something too that I think everybody needs to, to keep in mind is that there's no perfect number that you're gonna achieve that's gonna make your life problem free or you know it's just there's no easy button no level of success is gonna give that to you and yeah I struggle and whether that's you know just life or distractions it's you know really doing a deep dive into myself and figuring out how my brain works and, and being able to say, no, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. Um, I'm just, I don't have the, the ability to do it right now and being okay with that. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned briefly that like the first year or two was a loss. Um, sheer stubbornness and also I'm very competitive um, and I don't like to quit. And if I say I'm gonna do something, I try to do it. Um, I also made a deal with my husband. We um, were, you know, bills were, uh, bills were due and things were very tight, but I really, really wanted to do this, this indie thing. And I said, can you please give me two years? And if I am not doing this thing and making enough, um, I have a, a teaching degree. If I'm not making as much as a, a teacher would make after two years, um, I'll go and get a regular job. Um, but it's gonna be really hard for those maybe for those two years, and my husband believed in me, had faith in me, and he said yes, absolutely. Um, and that was a bet that he has won, because um, I've also bought him a car, so. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out well for him. Um, but yeah, just, just don't give up and be inspired by others. Like, there's so many stories in the 20 Books group, um, so many um, people doing amazing things, and just be like, that is gonna be me. Thank you. Um, I had a similar but slightly different question. Do I have to ask two or three? One question, ask two. Okay, one question, ask two. Um, so Mark and Laurie, bloopers you've made in your career and how you recovered from them. Oh, there are so many. Um, <laughs> Pick one. All right, so I put out a new book in a series with a, I went onto Facebook and I took all these polls and I asked them about covers and what kind of cover they wanted and, and everybody said, oh, definitely the mysterious cover or whatever. And I put out my new book with a mysterious cover and it fell flat, like crashed. And I thought, oh God, now what do I do? But you know what? You just say, well, the thing to do is recover it and do it in a hurry. So I did. And the thing about this is you cannot blow up your writing career. You may blow up a pen name or do some silly thing that crashes a book or anything like that, but it's all recoverable. You're never done unless you give up. Yeah. And um, Bicker Symes just gave a really good talk on that. 
what, what she said. No, and yeah, you, I have, don't even know how many failures I had, but you just go on, you learn from them, and you go on. It's not a problem. So before I started this career, I was very afraid of failing, and then I, I didn't do anything, and if you don't do anything, nothing happens. And then suddenly, I wasn't afraid of failing anymore. And since I failed a lot in the last 10 years than before, but it was also the best 10 years of my life. Last question. Okay, one of our online viewers would like to know, how do you continue to find inspiration or tap into your inner muse while maintaining productivity and achieving your practical goals? Pick two. Uh, Adam and Laurie. How do we tap into our inspiration while maintaining productivity goals? Oh, that's a good one. Lately, I think I've gotten better at this because I do have pretty firm deadlines out there and people are relying on me to send books to them at various times for editing or whatever. Uh, I usually miss the deadlines by a little, but never by too much. Number one way is if I know that I'm getting burnt out on something, I just let myself put it aside and go work on something that sounds more fun at the time with no pressure and I try to get back to the main thing as soon as I can. So I try to not beat myself up over the fact that I'm missing my deadline by a little bit, go have some fun. The last time I did this, I procrastinated for two weeks, and that is gonna be a, turned into a huge series that I'm gonna be launching early next year. So sometimes you just have to go with what's inspiring you, but everyone has to find that balance for themselves, productivity, deadlines, and inspiration. I read my own books. <laughs> And you have to just be forgiving with yourself. We can't be on top all the time, you know. Uh, bad days are normal. It's okay. Take it, and tomorrow you go again. So that's, um, that's the way to handle it. We don't have to be perfect. We just grow with time. Yeah, live for today, plan for tomorrow. That's all, Jeff. I'm sorry. We're out of time. Time. Look at the time. <laughs> Start on time, end on time. All right, that's it for our final panel. Please give them a hand. Yeah, we did it. Thank you all, thank you all.